all of my thoughts about the YouTube. If you're new to the channel, hi, I'm Shards. Welcome to the Shard Guys. How you make it on YouTube is ultimately determined by success, or rather, your definition of success. What others consider to be a success may not be your idea of success or someone else's idea. It may be too small or too big or completely irrelevant to what you're trying to achieve. Here's an example. I consider myself successful because I wanted to get 100,000 views and I got that. Now my next step is to get 500 subscribers and at some point, a play button. Your goal? There is no right or wrong goal. Now, a lot of people consider success to be full-time YouTube and full-time YouTube comes in two different ways. You either make exceptionally great videos, or you do what's called the grind, so slowly just build up your audience over time. See, there's nothing wrong with either of these, but if you're anything like me, both of those are kind of difficult to pull off. I like making videos, but I'm terrible at it. I just am. Great content also doesn't have to take a ton of work. Kind of like how you've seen some of my videos, if it's extremely entertaining, educational, or relatable, people will watch. It's like a friend hanging out, and that goes a long way. There are three ways to learn YouTube. Your experience from creating content, mentorship from somebody else, research. Your experience from making videos, thumbnails, titles, editing, and the like, teach you just like movie directors and book authors. You operate a channel with a different voice. The content you post, the subs you gain, the views you get, how you react to views, or the lack thereof, and the comments, all these things make you better over time if you don't believe me go ahead and after making a hundred videos and then look at your first one and i dare you to not cringe because you will and if you don't then that's bad because you should have improved from your first video and if you think your first video is still really good unless you have a background in filmmaking your first video is probably not going to be good now however there are some free cases where some people's first videos are actually pretty good and there's no problem with not cringing to that but for the majority of people if you're like me you suck at making videos but you may not realize that you're as bad as what you are you may think you make good content in reality you, you you don't i'm sorry to break it to you your channel is a pretty accurate representation of if you're good at making videos and relating to people and it goes both ways you can make the best video but if it's not relatable to people don't want to watch it and it can go the opposite way where you can relate to people but if it's just a horrible video no one's gonna watch it they're just gonna cringe now mentorship from an experienced creator can enhance and cultivate your creations, your videos, and all that so much quicker. It allows you to learn at a much quicker pace than when you did before, and you get to learn from someone else's mistakes so you don't repeat those. It also kind of creates a legacy because that information is passed on to you, who will maybe even pass it on to somebody else, whether that's your kid, another creator. When you get mentored, they take you on as their apprentice of sorts. Even if they don't really term it like that, that's what it is. And when you have a group of friends, or even just one that does YouTube alongside you, whether that's they have their own channel or whether you guys combine and you work on a channel together you are mentoring each other at the same time because each person can focus on learning a specific thing or a few different things and then what that person learns they tell the other person and then what this person learns they can tell that person and so together you learn at twice the pace and that's why it's so important to find somebody to grow with because otherwise you're just learning from your own mistakes and that only gets you so far with research the final way to learn youtube this is the only strategy that doesn't actually require youtube because because yes, you can study YouTube yourself, but you also can get books, audiobooks, and it's basically like the other two combined in a sense because you can go read or listen to the studies that other people have done, or if you want to involve YouTube, which does make sense, you take a look at, okay, what's all the thumbnails on this channel, or this all a bunch of thumbnails on this niche, and what's, what's all the different titles for this, what's the banners look like for that, what's the descriptions, and that is how you do research on, you study and analyze look for patterns in these various things that you can then implement in your own. You can talk to creators outside of YouTube, you write down your thoughts in some type of creator journal so you can look back and see how you grow or see how maybe you got better with something and honestly I recommend doing that for when you make videos as well as write down what you want that video to do, how you want it to perform. Now combining research with mentorship and experience helps your channel out a lot better than just doing research but any one of these three this is how you learn YouTube. Three simple words, no your audience. But why is this necessary and what does it matter? Put into practice, this enables you to make better videos, stream better, create better shorts, and so on and so forth. It allows you to do life better. Wait, how does this pertain to life? I thought we were talking about YouTube. Sometimes the audience is you. Think about your day job. You're making that product for a specific some someone. 
or you're selling a product to somebody. Now, if you know who you're selling it to, you can sell more than you usually sell. Make someone like the product better than usual because you know how to tailor it specifically to that person or that group of people. And none of that is related to YouTube. See, I've actually tested this outside YouTube with my life. Turns out I sell more things. I became a better salesman. See, when you know your audience, you know what they like. And when you know what they like, you know what to hand them. And you want to take that and you create or find something that they'll enjoy. And sometimes this means that you make something that they didn't know could be made or didn't know existed, but now they know that it does. They can't live without it and they gotta have it and they gotta have it now. That's what you gotta focus on. See, this entices viewers to trust you, not just because of your videos, but also because you're giving them something that they didn't even know that they wanted, which kind of makes them think a little bit, even if it's just subconscious, that you know them better than they know them, which is pretty impressive. Congratulations, good job on that, because you gave them their satisfaction that they have been looking for. Back to my real life example, I know my audience when I am a cashier. What I do is I take into account this person is buying this item, which is similar to XYZ. They like this, they may, they may like that, I bring it up, and naturally in a conversation, I would go something like this. Oh, hey, I noticed you got this. Do you also like this? Or hey, have you tried this? Hey, that looks pretty cool, but I know some people that buy this also like to buy this. Since you like this stuff, do you think you would like this? And as a result, I've actually sold things that some people, again, did not know existed, like Cool Ranch Dorito popcorn. People didn't know that existed until I showed them because they like Cool Ranch Doritos and they like popcorn. Now that they know that both exist simultaneously, they gotta try it. It didn't feel forced. It didn't feel like I was shoving it in their face and saying, you need to buy this and you need to buy it now. You can do the same thing with your viewers. All you have to do is think about your videos, think about the audience you're targeting, and sometimes you're targeting yourself. Sometimes you don't really care about the outside world, and that's okay, but tailor that video so that you're giving people something that they didn't even know they wanted or give them something that is just enjoyable it doesn't have to be good quality it just has to be relatable and satisfactory here's a little bit more in depth of my example and how you can do the same with youtube i notice my customer audience enjoys cool ranch doritos and popcorn you notice your audience enjoys your niche or maybe specific videos over a different niche or other videos i engage with my customer to confirm what he enjoys or doesn't doesn't enjoy and see how much the person person likes something. You make content and you talk to your audience and in return you get polls, comments, likes or dislikes. Or maybe you notice patterns in the views, whether that's how many views you get or the average view duration. I mentioned we also have Cool Ranch Street Popcorn and ask if he's interested. You meet viewer expectations, aka don't clickbait, and you prove yourself trustworthy and then you introduce something that they didn't expect. My customer asked me if I would vouch for the popcorn. Is the Cool Ranch Dorito popcorn any good? Is it worth buying? Is it yummy? I told him from my experience, because I had bought it and liked it, and that I enjoyed it. And he ended up buying the yummy popcorn. You read viewers' comments, look at the polls and the viewing patterns and so on, and then you start making videos that people request or start answering people's questions in the Q&A or make vid specific types of videos or maybe even a series based on the polls that you have made that people voted on. That's the power of knowing your audience, which causes channels to explode. How to start a YouTube channel better? No matter if you're a YouTuber or experienced, the channel needs a name, a goal, a theme, and a course the starting video. Notice I said nothing about your niche or your equipment and here is why. This is all you need to start YouTube and even that is honestly debatable and niche does not matter if the goal is to just have fun. If the goal is to get serious like what I'm trying to do then yes niche is important because you do need to post the same type of videos but if you go to just mess around and have fun on YouTube doesn't matter. As long as you're not breaking the TOS, go wild, do what you want. That's the fun of YouTube. Now, the name of your YouTube channel should be reflective of you. No matter what the other channel aspects are, it won't change the fact that the channel is an extension of you and people are going to know you based on that channel name. That is literally going to become your online presence. A fan sees you in real life, they're going to call you by your channel name. So you want this to be something that you can relate to and that you're okay with people calling you that. It can be silly, serious, dumb, smart, L literally can be anything you want. Although I recommend don't use a top tuber name like Mr. Beast, Dude Perfect, and so on because those names are already taken and already established. Go out and be your own person. Don't try to recreate somebody else. So now go on and ask yourself, what is your goal? Are you wanting to share your life, expand your passions, showcase your projects, your cooking skills? Are you just wanting to chase cloud and get famous? What is the 
the purpose of this channel. Or maybe you just want to prove to yourself and or the world that you are worthy of a play button. So if you could subscribe, if you like this content and share this out, oh, that would help so much. I just want a play button. Just one, just one. Maybe you don't really care about any of the other reasons I said and you just like to make videos and you want to see what happens. Well, guess what? That's actually how I started out. Now I'm trying to get a play button. Now, next up is your channel's theme. What is it going to look like? We're talking about the colors, the profile picture, the banner, and for those going the extra mile, your thumbnail templates and assets. Is this a solo channel or will you co-host? Is your thumbnails going to have brands? See, the neat thing is any of these answers can change at any point of time with the channel, whether it's the channel creation or the channel's 10 years old. Before we discuss the channel description, here's some things to avoid spending your time on until your channel is established, aka it's up and running. Playlists, home layout, scheduling, kind of debatable on that, and so is equipment. See, this is your channel. Reasonably, do what you want with your channel. If other people disapprove of the channel, okay, it's not for them, move on. Don't dwell on how other people would run your YouTube channel, because your YouTube channel is an extension of you, not an extension of them. And see here, I'm not talking about your audience, because you do want to cater to an audience. I'm talking about the people who say that you shouldn't do YouTube, or you're doing YouTube all wrong, and that you'll never make it on there. And while some of them may have some genuine advice to give you, you have to find your own voice on YouTube. You are your channel. They are not. And a lot of times, people will try to give advice when they've never even done YouTube or even made a video to begin with. So they don't know anything. They don't know what they're talking about, but we do, you and I. We get that. So now, take your thoughts about the channel direction, how you intend to use the channel, and where would you like to see it go? Turn that into the channel description. You want to tell the viewers what the channel is about, why it's worth their time, and not who you are, unless you're vlogging. In which case, that's kind of the whole point of the channel now, isn't it? The next steps to start the channel are to make between 2 and 10 videos. Create a milestone list, start a Discord server, relax, and most importantly, have fun. By by starting your channel with multiple videos, you give viewers a powerful option, binge watching. See, when people watch two or more of your videos, the algorithm, <laughs> because it shows that viewers are enjoying your videos enough to watch multiple of them at once, thus they are staying on the platform longer than anticipated, which is the main thing that YouTube cares about. Get viewers on the platform, get them to stay. And if you're doing that, then your viewers are going to keep getting pushed out, so that is why you want to start between two and ten videos, because you will be doing that. Now, this also makes viewers more likely to want to subscribe to your channel because they can see you're serious about this. And you have a library, it's not just one video. Now, creating a milestone is going to be important because you want to hit a certain viewpoint or you want a certain amount of subscribers or maybe you want to have a certain amount of videos done by a certain time period. And by setting those attainable goals, you will strive to meet those goals. And then when you do, then you set new ones and that is how you continue to grow. Not just as a channel, but as a person. Channel planning is a must if you want to grow. Even basic planning will make production easier and scheduling not as much of a concern as well as tracking your goals. See, most commonly done in December or before somebody starts a new channel, these plans help creators figure out what they want to achieve, what direction they want their channel to go into, and where they want to be in the future. Plans ensure that you stay consistent and help you focus increasing the chance that you hit those deadlines and whatever you're aiming for. That can be a certain amount of videos, subscribers, view count, knowledge, whatever it is, you'll be more prepared than just randomly throwing stuff out there and and I'm not saying random is bad, it can be a good thing, but however, keep in mind when you start to be consistent, kind of like a TV channel with shows that show up at a certain time, viewers are more likely to engage with your content because they know when it's going to come out and they can plan on that and around it. They want to know when they can get fresh content. See, you don't have to plan out every single detail. You can if you want. To get you started, here are some ideas for planning your channel's future. Uploads per week, yearly subscriber gain, daily views. Home layouts are important because it's the follow-up to the first impression. See, the home layout is where viewers are quickly going to discern what your channel is about and if it's going to be worth their time. And that's why placement is critical on what sections you have, how many of them you have, and which ones are at the top and which ones are at the bottom, and do they match your banner? Do they match your about section, the description of your channel? These things actually matter because it can be the difference between looking like something that's worth someone's time versus they 
they could care less. It's your resume, so to speak, for viewers to kind of do an interview to see if should I subscribe to this person, should I watch their content. On a resume, you want to look at your best as good as possible, right? And so it is the same thing with your home layout. You want that to look as neat and as clean as possible and make it look shiny and attractive just as you would your resume when you're trying to get a new job. So whatever bids you put at the top of the layout is where you're most likely to get clicked. Regardless of the, at the time of this recording, the new For You section now is added. Whatever section you put at the top, that is going to be most likely where people click. If you have the For You section on, which I highly recommend you do turn that on, that's kind of going to be a little iffy on some viewers are going to be more likely to click the For You section and some are going to be more likely to click the other section. Now, one mistake to avoid here is you do not want to use a lot of sections. If you look at what Mr. Beast has, he only has a couple sections and here's why. See, viewers don't want to keep scrolling to find out what your channel is about. They're going to take a look at your channel. They're going to take a look at that homepage. They might look at videos. They might look at your community posts. And from there, they're going to decide, is this creator worth my time? Now, they may not ask themselves that, but that's what they're thinking. That's what the motions are going through. And so when you only have a couple sections, that helps them to quickly see, okay, this is what they have. This is what the channel's about. And then it actually encourages them because there's not much there to look at. It encourages them to go and explore the other sections of your channel, like the videos, the community posts, and your and your description. Before the for you section was added to YouTube, Mr. Beast used just three sections on his channel. He'd have his new up uploads, popular uploads, and then a sub to all channel showing all of that is basically a channel recommendation which avoids the dreaded scroll that viewers dislike. It's short, it's simple, it's very obvious on hey this is who he is, this is what he does, and this is where else you can find him if you don't want to watch that channel or if you want to watch another channel in addition. Now I'm not telling you that you need to use the new video section and the popular video section. Figure out what works best for your channel on pick three sections or maybe even two since the for you section is a thing now that's going to be best fit for your channel and prioritize showcasing that. You want to showcase the best part of your, your video library that's going to get the most attention because again it comes back to first impressions or rather in this case second impressions because they've already discovered you through a community post, a short, a video, or a live stream or maybe even a twitter post or discord. You want to stick in their mind because as soon as they leave you don't know if they're going to come back. They might not. So you want to give them a reason to come back. Multiple reasons really. Use discord and set up a server. It gives your community a place to hang out to communicate with each other and it gives you a place to talk to your fans directly and them to you in real time instead of just leaving a comment and just waiting around for some type of reply you can use it to talk to your audience play games with them ask them questions give them announcements on hey there's a new video or new stream literally anything they might offer up suggestions or uh, for find some other type of way to interact with you and a lot of times they're more comfortable with discord than they are with pretty much almost any other social media especially youtube because there's not really much you can do with youtube you can't really talk to people on there and you can on discord at the gaming version of skype it started out for gamers and now it's for everybody see with youtube specifically having a discord server for your youtube channel doesn't just give your community a place to gather it widens your audience so that people from other discord servers can actually discover your channel through discord by just looking up youtube server and then they might see your server pop up click on that join your discord talk to some community members and then maybe end up subscribing to you on YouTube as well as the fact that let's say you quit YouTube or you get banned or God forbid YouTube dies now your discord server is going to be very vital in that situation because you have a fallback for yes you're gonna lose a major part of your audience but there's still quite a bit of your audience that's on discord so you haven't lost everything not yet you still have a portion of it which is better than none and if you're like me and you have multiple platforms that you're on like for me i am on youtube kick discord and twitter well what it actually does is it takes these different families is what i like to call it different fan bases you have your youtube fan base you have your kick fan base you have your twitter fan base etc and what discord does is it takes all those people and it merges them together so you have your different families and then you can combine them into this just this awesome community that's just everybody all at once and in addition to that because one family or group can talk to another family they can convert them so that someone that will start watching on youtube might start watching you stream on kick or someone that followed you on twitter might start watching your videos on youtube there's another thing too on discord doesn't just let you talk to your fans it allows you to talk to other creators and collaborate with them as well whether that's for stream 
streams, chefs, game developers, video creators, book writers, you name it, Discord's got it. Your studio will grow and expand just as your creator journey does. This is a good, but sometimes can be expensive kind of thing. The best way to grow your studio is to buy things as you need them, which is actually how Mr. Beast did and how I've done it. All the equipment I have, the cameras looking through at you right now, the, the lights that are shining on my face, the green screen. I didn't buy that all at once. This took over three years to get all of this. And it's because I buy things when you need it, when you learn how to use those things. As you improve their videos over time and focus on improving the audio, Video or the video quality or the lighting, etc. That's when you want to buy those things. That's also why I have multiple microphones at this point. I've literally started just with this and so have thousands of other successful creators. With that being said, I'm not telling you to start with your phone. I'm not telling you to start with the studio. What I'm saying is start with what you know how to use. Because once you know how to use that, there's no point in not using utilizing, but you don't want to enter your bank account with something that you have no clue what how it works. Because then you're just robbing your cell phone. Now, as far as computers goes, I highly recommend you get a computer because it's a lot easier to edit and monitor your channel from there. But you don't necessarily have to do that because again, there are apps for this thing that allow you to edit, record, and all of that stuff. And the cameras are getting better all the time for phones. But I will say computers do have a lot better storage than the phone does. When you notice something in your videos you don't like, that is when it's time to upgrade something. For example, I wanted to upgrade my audio. My audio has not always been great in the past. So I switched from my phone mic to this mic. And then later on in a couple years, I switched from this to this. That's the Elgato mic. And by far, I love that mic a lot more than I like the other one. You can hear my voice more clear through it. You don't necessarily need to get the best of everything. After all, this definitely is not the most high quality phone. These webcams are not the most high quality webcam, nor is this tripod, but it's what works for me. I'm making the best of what I have as I need to get. You want to work your way up with what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable using basic things, use basic things. If you want to learn how to do more advanced stuff, then use the advanced stuff. Another thing to note is don't get hung up on green screens. You don't need to have something fancy like what I have right here. You want to know how I got started with the green screen? It was a green piece of poster board that I attached to this. That was my first green screen. Not very effective, but it worked. I ended up graduating to this and using this as the backdrop to stabilize my green screen, which this is just a bed frame. Not really what you would consider professional, but hey, it worked at the time. And then I got this that I could detach on it and it looks so much better. But wait, after a while more. Then I got this tripod to hang the green screen on and now I'm getting to make the videos like what you're seeing currently. But you see, I didn't start with this green screen. It changed over time as I needed an upgrade. And you need to do the same thing with your assets. Focus on upping your video quality as much as possible. Focus on one thing at a time, and as you do that, your studio will grow around you, just like mine did. And you may be wondering why listen to me when I'm obviously not the owner of a play button. I'm not a large YouTuber. First off, equipment is expensive. Secondly, you might buy stuff that you don't even need. Like for example, I bought my audio mixer. Thanks to that, I got a mic, I have a digital one. So this one isn't even neat. I didn't look into the digital one before I bought this because I thought, oh, well, I'll probably need this. When in reality, I don't. That is why you want to pay attention to what parts of your studio you're buying and if you actually need it or not so you can save money instead of just breaking your bank. By not spending money on unnecessary equipment, it frees up money for equipment that you do need. As well as it frees up your time to make better videos or to learn how to make better videos like what like watching videos like this. And of course, with that free time, you can also figure out how do you la launch your own merch or how do you get people to make videos with you. And you know, put your money in the savings too. And by not constantly buying equipment, you save you save up time to learn how do you use this new equipment efficiently. So it's not just lying around where you could use it or you're using it, but not really and not really well. Not to mention the storage space. If you don't have room for the equipment, probably shouldn't be buying it. You should think about how much storage space you have before you buy more equipment. Don't buy more than what you got room for, please. Are you and other channels really competing or are you just coworkers? Fair question. It's both. But how can that be? Well, much like a day job or night job for you third shifters, the channel hosts, creators, are making stuff, videos, streams, shorts, and community posts, and it's pretty much like a book. Authors with different voices. You all have the same job, but with a different outcome. Some get more views than others, some get more subscribers, and then there's us, you and me. We don't 
get that much and we're not satisfied with where we are. See, this is where we become competitive, not just for the click, but to grow faster than so-and-so and to keep improving from our past, or maybe get more views than our friends. You see, it turns the job of YouTube into a game complete with custom achievements that you get to decide. Play buttons, video quality, sub count, view count, and other stuff becomes the fuel and the energy and the drive behind all of this. We want to stand out even though we are doing the same thing as other channels, creating content. We all do it. <laughs> and then there's collaborations and shout outs. Bit of a wild card there. See, collaborations give channels a chance to merge a little bit of their audience and kind of swap them a little bit. Yeah, you set aside your competition and become more of a coworker. Unless both record and then it goes back to competitively co-working. And shout out is similar to getting praise or kind of like a bonus or promotion from your boss. It grants new subscribers and definitely extra views. However, most people don't know how to handle it. Shout outs can provide massive opportunities if used correctly, but they can also be wasted. So let's talk about you Using, utilizing them to maximize that momentum. First off, what is a shout out? A shout out is when a creator gives attention to another creator or to a viewer by name, usually asking viewers to go follow them or simply giving the creator credit for something that they made. Whether that's inspiration or maybe it's a, the video that the creator reacted to or maybe a creator helped them make a video. Sometimes they can be given to a viewer for commenting on a video. Shoutouts are given to others as creators see fit and typically will not be given to those who beg or demand one. So how does one receive a shoutout? You could help a creator make a video like I did with Shark when we emptied an entire Minecraft world of blocks, or in another video I made with him, we played cops and robbers. Or another way you, you can get a shout out is leave a comment on a video or even suggest creators have a certain type of merge or do a series or giveaway or a certain video and hope they pick your comment. Now, how to avoid wasting the shout out so you've gotten a shout out, but how do you avoid wasting the shout out like I did? Well, it starts with the reaction. You're probably going to freak out with joy, especially if it's from a large YouTuber like it was in my case, or if it's your first time and there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy freaking out. What you want to do next after that is going to determine whether that momentum stays or starts subsiding and it's gone. Because once it's gone, it's gone. What you want to do is make content that you, the new audience that has come from that shadow is going to enjoy so that they stay and merge with your pre-existing audience. Now, those videos may be something you're already doing or maybe a new direction that you were kind of heading into or maybe something that you've never even tried, but you're willing to try. And if you're not sure, you can always ask viewers whether it's in a video or maybe do a community post and say, hey, what do you guys want? It's as simple as that. And let's say that nobody comments on your community post. Take a deep breath, analyze the video from where the shadow came from, and start from there. Channel history is simple. It's the content that's been watched on the channel and posted on it. The history retains how long the videos existed, how much received on it, and the interaction likes and dislikes that it has received, as well as the community posts on the channel itself. VidIQ's AI coach states that channel history is the past content and activity of a channel, including videos, playlists, I forgot playlists or thing, comments, and other interactions, such as what I mentioned in my explanation. Now, what is the used for. Channel history can help channels get verified for things like community posts. YouTube themselves have actually said that the history is the it's the channel activity, engagement, personality, its usage, and actually the Google connections as well. After up to two months, in most people's cases, those advanced permissions unlock tags. What is their purpose? Well, unless you're part of the same event or trend that's going on, like Rewind, New Year's, Squid Game, they won't help you with discoverability. Let me say that again. They won't help with discoverability. In fact, too many tags for one video can actually get your video penalized and well, and will reduce the discoverability on that video instead of expanding it. But what even is a tag, let alone how to use or misuse it? There are two types of tags for YouTube, the video tags and the channel tags. Video tail, tails, video tags are 
help viewers understand what a video is about or what it's related to. It's it's kind of like a summarized description, kind of like the synopsis of a book. They are compatible with SEO, keyword research, whatever you want to call that, but too many kind of create clutter around the video. Lots of YouTubers don't even use tags. If you decide to use them, I recommend only using a handful of them to avoid this clutter and penalization from YouTube. And of course, use vidIQ's extension to come up with some very helpful tags. I have used that in the past and it has helped out quite a bit. Channel tags, however, do actually impact the channel discoverability. And what they do is it tells the algorithm slightly more about what the channel is about. Kind of like how the video tags do. There's not much difference when it comes to discoverability. No way close to the main thing that can cause discoverability, but it can impact it just a little bit. These channel tags tell the algorithm what the channel is about, what it's related to, and what types of YouTube viewers it needs to pair your content with. That's also why when you look up certain things, you'll see channels pop up instead of just videos because they have those tags placed there. Something I just learned a few days before planning this video out was that tags, both channel and video, actually have a huge impact on the ads that you are watching, which is incredible. I, uh, I didn't, I actually did not know that beforehand, but I understand why. I mean, it makes sense on, you know, if you're watching gaming content, you would want, then it's going to show a gaming ad and not, you know, like a cooking ad or something. Although that does and can happen. Now, one question remains, do tags really matter? We discussed what they are, what they do, and the two types, but are they worth using for your channel well that's gonna be up to you me personally i don't really care about tags i used to in the past once in a while i do use tags but for the most part i don't but i'd love to hear in the comments below do you use tags watch them is not as balanced as what you may think do youtube shorts don't even count towards monetization yes you heard that correctly they don't count and neither do live streams live streams at one point did count toward monet monetization 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 that's the word that's the word i was looking for now once a stream ends then it gets converted to a normal video and any views on that video on watch time that's accumulated after the conversion does count toward monetization not monetization i don't know what that is i don't think i want to know what that is and then we have the abnormalities of videos that break youtube you may have seen them they're oftentimes they have the title this video breaks youtube and the way that they do it is pretty simple they speed up a video so that you have to watch the whole video or part of a video at half speed or a quarter of a speed and what this does is creates more watch time in that little segment or that video than what is supposed to be possible like for example you make a one minute video but but you speed it up so that people have to watch it at half speed then you get two minutes of watch time from one view out of a one minute video that's technically not supposed to be possible but it is possible if people you do that and that's how you can get up to i believe with quarter speed four times the watch time from one video and if you don't believe me go ahead and look it up this actually has happened numerous times by different youtubers and if you want to make your own video to test out if this works or not here's how it's pretty simple make your video like normal speed it up make sure at the beginning of the video to tell viewers to slow it down for understandability and yeah that's it but why is this abnormal because slow down videos don't just create more watch time for a video it creates a higher retention curve especially if you only have a specific part that's sped up that people will watch longer versus any other parts because it shows this one part for some reason is just so grabbing their attention the algorithm loves that now that combined with the more watch time if you have that for the entire video all of a sudden the algorithm starts looking again and again and then again for more viewers to push it out to to see if they will like it too sponsorships and brand deals are not the same thing but they both have benefits you as a creator get money and they get exposure oh who's they well whoever you sign the deal with regardless of if it's a sponsor or a brand deal. Now the difference between the two is that the sponsorships are paying you to advertise something, whereas brand deals is more of like a partnership type of thing. Before agreeing to anything, always find all the details and confirm that the that the company is legit and not scamming you. Nobody likes being a scam. Also don't click bait. Also, make sure you believe in the product or service servers? Service that you are showcasing to your audience because this will not only help you build trust with your audience but also why would you promote something that you don't actually enjoy 
promote the good stuff and not the bad stuff, please. Remember that the, the things you promote on your channel, it does reflect on you, ultimately. Now see, any channel can get sponsored or sign a brand deal. Doesn't matter what your size is. I mean, you look at my channel, it's less than 500 subscribers at the time of recording this. I got my first brand deal when I had like 400 subs. I got sponsored at like about the same thing. Actually, I think I got my first brand deal when I was three something. It's three to 400 subscribers, which is still pretty impressive that I've managed to land, I believe, two brand deals and one sponsor at the time of this. I am partnered with Fanatical, Listener, and then my sponsor is La Crafters from who are the creators of Toaster Ball. They gave me a free product. They gave me a free Steam key. When the game is amazing, go ahead and check that out if you haven't already. Not sure how to get these deals? Well, it's pretty simple on first and foremost, you got to reach out to people. You got to communicate. Second of all, don't come off as begging and, and please give me that brand deal. Don't do that. And, and... And when you reach out to them, don't go the other extreme where you're like, Yo, look at me, you should give me this. This is who I am, I'm legit. No, they don't care who you are, okay? See, what you want to do is say, Hey, I used your product or your user service. I really enjoyed this. Would you be willing to sponsor me? I would love to, ma to make a video with you or about this type of thing or about this item, please. When you come off as trying to help them out, they are much more likely to want to help you out because it's a mutual benefit thing and it and it doesn't pawn you off as a needy person or as an arrogant person. Now see, how I got my brand deal through Fanatical was I just started looking for affiliate links on stuff I already used. In the case of Fanatical, I have already used Fanatical to get discounts, legit discounts on Steam keys. And so because I use it so much, I started wondering on, hey, is there any way I can partner with them? Because this is awesome, and I love this, and I want to promote. I want to show you guys this. And I got lucky with. They did have an affiliate program. I applied and I got accepted. And that's what you got to do. Now, when you reach out to a company, it doesn't guarantee that you will get every deal that you want or apply for. And it's even possible that you will get rejected by every single one. But Either way, whether you get accepted by all of them, some of them, or none of them, it's okay because at least you are trying and it goes to show that even if you get rejected originally, you may get accepted later down the, the line because people see you grow as a creator into your persistence. As for deals they might get, there's click campaigns, reviews, they'll pay you per, they'll pay you to make a review video basically they might send you a free product and there's probably other stuff that i'm forgetting the number one lie that most youtubers leave is that youtube is all luck based there's rng involved but i think it's a very small percentage a lot of people confuse bad skills small exposure and honestly a lack of understanding of the algorithm I think they can be said for any social media what it takes is a personality and a passion a lot of times a lot of people just take that mindset and just throw it away you can get lucky rng and you can get unlucky rng but in the end it's still rng i mean i could be wrong i'm not a youtube guru people don't want to admit that they can improve on something you're not grabbing the viewer's hand and forcing them to click they get to choose what they want to watch you don't get to choose what viewers want to watch and YouTube doesn't get to choose either. Yeah, YouTube can show them a selection, but they have the option to just ignore that selection, go hunting for something else, or to just close YouTube entirely. And I think a lot of times people look at the numbers, I know I do, and we forget those numbers are not just numbers. They're people. Viewers get to choose the videos that they want to watch. Sometimes that means they choose you, and sometimes they means they choose somebody else. You can influence their choice but you can't make it for them. You can throw up a fancy title or show a fancy thumbnail and do all that. You can make whatever videos that you want, but in the end, the viewers get to choose which video they feel like watching at that specific time. It's the viewers who are in control of the platform, not us creators. As they browse and scroll through YouTube and see the recommendations, they get to choose what channel they want to watch, if they want to look through subscriptions or recommendations and see what thumbnail pops out to them or what type of video do they want. Do they want a cooking video today? Do they want a dancing video today? Do they want a home decoration video? They get to choose what, they're, what they are looking for or what just feels like is something fun to watch. As well as maybe I don't want to watch this video right now but I want to save it for later. That is also up to them. Again, you can influence that but you don't get to make that choice neither does YouTube. Although YouTube has a 
much bigger influence and impact than we creators do, although we'll say that. Because we don't get to decide, alright, my next video is going to be shown to a thousand people. <laughs> That'd be amazing if we could set that. I mean, doesn't still doesn't guarantee the click, but imagine, like, the chaos that went into if we tried that. <laughs> I feel like some people would get very successful, and some people would probably just get annihilated and stand no chance. I would probably get pushed down even more than I already am. <laughs> just like creators, yours come in all sizes and shapes, different backgrounds, all that stuff. And these various experiences and cultures are what make up their mindset of what they are looking for. Some viewers are down to watch literally anything and everything, from live streams to shorts to normal videos this niche to that niche and everything in between they want it all others specifically just want shorts on let's say home decoration again other people prefer minecraft light streams it depends on the viewer and that is why knowing your audience is so important and while you can't control your viewers like i said you can't influence them and here's how oftentimes these viewers are people just like you and if you're targeting yourself then you can create thumbnails that pop out to you and people like you and titles that are very intriguing and prompt people to want to want to click or get a little confused by the thumbnail the title explains it and then they click because they want to know okay what's going on in this how does this work and bam that is how you get your click that is how you get your viewers. And that was to influence, not control. There's a very, very big difference. And upon doing so, you take that appeal that you have by, by tailoring your thumbnails and titles to a specific audience. You're capitalizing on that appeal that you have to them, which makes, you, which makes them more likely to want to click on your stuff. That could be anything from branding to maybe it's just a maybe really super eye-catching thumbnails. Because here's the thing. You can make the worst thumbnails on the planet. But if you have branding, then every time your audience sees your videos, they instantly recognize and they say, Oh, hey, I know this person. This, is, this, per this video is from this channel. And they don't even have to look at the description or at to see or at the channel to see if it actually is from that channel because they just know because it's so obvious from the thumbnail because you've made similar thumbnails branding is key and important but again you can make the best thumbnail or the worst thumbnail the best brand or the worst thumbnail or best brand and the worst brand but if the viewer doesn't want it doesn't matter this strategy from Film Booth made me pretty skeptical that it was actually going to work, but after trying it on my own video that kind of tanked, turns out that this actually works. Hold on, what are you talking about? What strategy? You haven't told me this yet. It's very simple. You take a video that's already been posted, you change the thumbnail, you change the title, maybe you change both, and all of a sudden, your video gets new life breathed into it. And if you think I'm wrong, well, let me show you what happened when I did this. My Unity video, which talks about how Unity screwed over game devs, very much underperformed. It only had like four views after a few days and it just was not getting any traction. Then I changed the thumbnail and I changed the title. It not only went from being a 10 out of 10 video of just being the absolute worst, but then it ended up not just becoming the top one video out of the last 10 videos I published of the best, one of the best videos I've ever released apparently. I believe number eight on my channel at the time of this recording, which in my opinion, I don't think it's that good, but new viewers apparently disagree with me and like it a lot better than the other stuff. And all because I didn't change the editing. I actually made the editing a lot more simple, a lot more basic, like I am with this video. But what changed is different thumbnail, different title. But how does this work? Why does changing the thumbnail and title breathe new life into a video? Well, sometimes a more reworded title just makes more sense to people than it did prior. And sometimes it causes more curiosity now, the reason why a thumbnail might need to be changed is maybe the thumbnail is too basic and people just are not interested in it. Or maybe it's just super busy with so many different things just everywhere that people just want to look away and they want anything to do with the video. They don't want to associate some, themselves watching it because eh, that just it, it's just a head scratcher, you know? It just it looks weird. It's confusing. Make the thumbnail a lot better and a lot less busy. Then it's going to grab their attention and all of a sudden they're watching. Remember, they're watching. 
They're always watching. But what happens if you try replacing one of these and nothing happens? Well, one of two things is the case here. Either you didn't give YouTube enough time to update with the new title or thumbnail, or the new packaging that you put on there is not as good as you think thought it was, in which case it comes down to trial and error. You start tr trying different thumbnails and titles at the same time the algorithm is searching different niches and looking for the right viewer. You got to work together on, okay, how do we make this the most presentable to the best viewer possible so that when the algorithm finds that viewer, the video is ready. And this is the beauty and horror of YouTube itself. One thing I highly suggest that you do, match the quality of the thumbnail with the video you're putting it on. If you're continuously putting good thumbnails on horrible videos that don't deserve good thumbnails, it kind of creates this clickbaity feel and people start kind of like not wanting to trust your old content, even if they do trust your new content. And if you don't believe me that this is the way you should go about it, go ahead and look at Mr. Beast or even some of the other large YouTubers. But if you take a look at his thumbnails, Look at his old videos, he doesn't update them. He leaves them be. And that's because their quality is nowhere near the quality of his modern, current time videos. So let your old videos die and breathe new life into the ones you're currently working on. This also ensures that and frees up the time so you can make even more videos and hopefully make them better. Ipilin Alter blew my mind with her video about how Mr. Beast solved YouTube. In it, she mentions what I call duet cycles. Introduce a story chapter, a bullet point, or a chapter like in a book, or like a scene in a movie, cycle A, and then the explanation, cycle B. This caught me off guard because I never thought about a videos like this. Nor did I ever see this pattern from Mr. Beast and even from other large YouTubers until I saw her video. And now that April's video has made me aware of this pattern, I can't unsee it. Of every video I watch, I see this. It's so glaringly obvious that it's like, why didn't I think of this before? How did I not see this before? And it's because I wasn't asking the right questions. I wasn't looking for it. And it probably goes the same with you as well. So how do we utilize this awesome strategy? Well, first off, you, you gotta take off one pair of glasses and put on a different pair and start looking more closely at your plans for how are you making your videos. These are the different plot points, like a story that you want to hit in your video. And after you hit every single one of those plot points and you show the viewer those plot points, you want to have a slowed down version right after that. And that basically goes more in depth to each point and shows the aftermath of this is what the result is. So you want to build something if you're doing a Minecraft video or you know like do something crazy in survival mode, whatever. And then after each part that you show kind of go more in depth and explain and show like how it was made or how you survive something blah 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 or like if you're cooking for example maybe you're cooking a few different types of pies and then you want to show a pie and maybe explain a little bit about like why you like making that specific pie and they go more in depth on like these are the ingredients these are maybe you have that different cooking time than the others maybe you have a different personal connection etc and then you move on to the next that is what I would call a duet cycle you have your cycle A your cycle B your bullet point and your explanation the chapter and the end depth. You want to make sure that you visually explain what is going on to the viewer. It's literally show and tell. It's the adult version of show and tell. This isn't child play. This is this is an actual thing. And if you don't believe me, this is cinema and video creation entirely. Like, this is not just YouTube, but like, how to make a good video for anything is literally show and tell. I just watched a video yesterday with my parents where on normal TV, not YouTube, where the person was showing a few different things from a tiny home they were building. And there was this instance where he goes, where he starts listing off various parts like a ceiling fan and then he shows a ceiling fan at the same time he says the words a ceiling fan giving more effect to what he's saying it's show and tell literally and you can do the same with youtube in fact the more that you do this show and tell the more likely your channel is going to take off done correctly this immensely ups your quality sometimes even your relatability as a person and just overall just captures the attention and mind of the viewer now some people upon hearing this it's only going to take them a few tries it's going to click no pun intended other people like me it's going to take some time to perfect this and understand how to do this correctly it's going to take a while and that's okay but it is going to take work so there's no point in beating yourself up because you're just making things worse for yourself you gotta remember that rome was not built in one day it took time and so does video creation. You think by not rushing yourself, you open yourself to understanding why you're doing the things you're doing, and you'll appreciate later why you didn't rush yourself. Enjoy the learning curve and make sure to improve with every single video you make. Stop doing outros. I disagree with Nate, but I still think of my outros as an outro. I create a two second outro and then encourage viewers to watch the video that the algorithm recommends. YouTube knows people a lot better than I do. And believe me, Nate does have a good point on how people build up their outros. Don't 
don't do that because then people leave early and when people leave early that's a lot of watch time that can cost you a viral video what do you mean a viral video when a viewer leaves early no matter how early they leave you lose watch time and the watch time combined with click-through rate is going to be how your channel explodes in comments the interaction the likes the dislikes yes believe it or not dislikes can actually tell the algorithm to push your video out more because it shows that people care about enough to say hey this is great or this sucks the thing about outros look at mr beast for example he just cuts off his videos immediately at the time he doesn't even recommend a video for you to watch why does he do this that's how you get the maximum amount of watch time is you cut the video off before the viewer even knows that the video is over 